morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Somerville. We invite you all to stand and join us for Open praise and worship. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and
Yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling on me. The only name that matters to me. And yours is a name, a name that saved me. Mercy and grace, the power that forgave me. In your love is all. and affection I need to feel my father smiling on me the only name that matters to me and yours is the name the name that saved me mercy and grace the power that forgave me and your love is all I've ever needed Tell my story There will be one name That I proclaim When I wake up When I wake up In the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name That I proclaim Alright, the kids in the back Sing this really loud La 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 to declare the name of Jesus. Jesus. Sing it louder. Jesus. Jesus. Just that name. Sing it again. Jesus. 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 Just that name When I wake up in the land of glory When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story be one name that I proclaim. La 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 You know, that seems so kind of a little silly, right? La, la, la. But you know what? One day we're going to be singing in heaven, and it's going to be a choir, and we're just going to be singing carefree. It's just going to flow from our lips, and it's an amazing thought. It's an amazing, amazing reality for those who uh, trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So this morning, God, we just... Thank you, Father. We thank you that we get to gather here. We get to praise you and worship you in song, Lord, and that, Father, what we're singing is our reality. God, you're so, so good, and we love you. Father, you're worthy. You're so worthy. You've prepared a place for us, God. You're powerful. There's nothing outside of your control. So, Father, we just give you all glory and praise that you deserve this morning. In Jesus' name. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Who 
know the shadows deeper we do do you think that all the dark will stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new we do it's all creation groaning it is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah. Who conquered the grave He is David's root And the Lamb who died To ransom the slave Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory Is He worthy? Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Is our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. between us 
How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great You. 
done for us. God, your unfailing love, your mercy, your grace. Father, we praise you. And we glorify you. And we thank you, Father, for preparing a place for us, for making it possible for us to have a relationship with the living God and giving us a living hope, giving us a Savior. Father, you've defeated death. Is anything too hard for you? We just come before you this morning as we are. We ask, God, that you would just search our hearts, Lord. You know us. You know what we need. Father, you can gently speak to our hearts. You can convict us, God. You can lead us and guide us into all truth by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, may we be willing vessels this morning. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for listening to Change the World with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville. It is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with today's message, here's Pastor Vic. Pray. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all that is in heaven, all that is in the earth. And Lord, we are your creation. We see, Lord, how you sustain those you love. We see how you sustain your creation. You are Jehovah Jireh, the great provider. And as your people, Lord, we gather here this morning to worship you in spirit and truth, to spend some time in prayer, to spend some time in your word, God. And I pray as we open up your word that your Holy Spirit would move about this place, God, that every word that's spoken would be directly from your lips to our ears, that you would give us hearts to receive, that you would give us like minds, Father, the mind of Christ, that we may hear all that you say to us this morning and that it may envelop every part of our being, Lord, to help mold us and shape us into who it is that you would desire each of us to be. Would you anoint our time, Father? Would you bless it? Would you be with us today, God? Speak to us, Lord, through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. And we are in chapter 9 as we continue our journey through God's Word. And if you're joining us online, Calvary Chapel of the Air, uh, welcome to you guys today uh, as well. Paul's in the middle here in 1 Corinthians of answering a series of questions that the Corinthian church had written uh, to him about. And they presented Paul uh, with different circumstances in life and wanted to know how a Christian is to operate uh, in these circumstances. How is a Christian to view uh, sex? How is a Christian to operate as a single person? Then questions about marriage and divorce and widowhood. And then in chapter 8, Paul began to expound, and he's going to continue over the next couple of chapters here, uh, expound on the subject of Christian liberty, the freedom or the rights that we have in Christ based on knowledge. And he pointed out how we are free in Jesus. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's good to be free. But Paul also pointed out, more importantly, how the freedom that we have in Christ must always be subservient to our love for others. And the example that Paul used was sort of a sticky point there in the first century church was the eating of meat that had been sacrificed to false idols. And how uh, Paul talked about how that could be offensive to uh, new believers or people who were uh, very legalistic. And he pointed out how we as Christians, we have the right, we have the, we have the liberty to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols simply based on the fact that an idol is nothing. It's not even real. God is not threatened by some man-made false idol. So the eating of meat that was sacrificed to that idol is not going to defile me as a Christian. So Paul says, if you want to eat it, go ahead. You know, God doesn't care. And he pointed out how food, what you eat, what you don't eat, uh, does not make you any more or less holy. So you have, you have the freedom to eat what you want. And, and, and it's the more mature Christians who have this knowledge. However, 
Paul says there are some Christians who are still stuck in infancy, babes in Christ as Paul called them, those still bound up in legalism. And to them, eating meat that had been sacrificed to an idol would be unthinkable. It would be outright sin. And Paul didn't rebuke that kind of thinking other than to, to label them as the, the weaker brothers and, and sisters in Christ. But the point is, that, that they have to walk by their convictions the same as us. We all have to be guided by and obedient to our conscience. And so for you, as the stronger, more mature Christian, though you have liberty, if you're a weaker brother who doesn't have the knowledge of that liberty, he sees you partaking in something that he views as sin, then, then you're going to cause him to stumble. You're going to lure him into doing something that, that his conscience says to him is wrong. And anytime a person goes against you know, their conscience or goes against what their conscience is telling them is wrong, that's sin. And Paul pointed out, if your liberty causes your brother to stumble, causes him to sin, then you have sinned yourself. Not only against your brother, but more importantly, he said, you've sinned against Christ. And so Paul closed out the chapter last week by saying, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again as long as I live. Thus demonstrating the idea and the, the entire theme of that chapter, chapter 8, that love is to be the supreme ethic in the heart of a Christian. Liberty is important. Knowledge is important, but love trumps liberty. Love trumps knowledge. For the Christian, love trumps all. And Paul, here in chapter 9, he's going to illustrate how he, even as, a, as an apostle, one who has uh, apostolic authority, he himself, his liberty is subservient to love. And he's going to point out how he walks in that. His life is a demonstration of, of love over liberty. I don't know many men that would say, uh, you know, I love meat, I love a big T-bone steak, but I'll never eat another piece of meat as long as I live if it causes my brother to stumble. But that's the Apostle Paul. It's love over uh, liberty and how his life demonstrates that. And so he begins here in verse 1 by asking a couple of rhetorical questions. He asks, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Now, we talked in the earlier chapters about the difference between an apostle, which is simply one who is sent, which all Christians can identify with that broad definition uh, of the word apostle. We're all Christians are apostles in that sense that we have been uh, sent to go uh, become disciple makers. Uh, but Paul here is referring to the office of of apostle, excuse me, which is very important. It's something that only 12 men in human history were called to. Um, 13, if you count Judas. But, but Paul was chosen. You remember the book of Acts. Paul was chosen by Jesus to take the place of Judas once Judas betrayed Jesus and, and committed suicide. But you have 12 men that were handpicked by Jesus himself that were commissioned to go and lay the foundation of the church. And so Paul asks, am I not an apostle? Do I not hold the office of apostle? In other words, Paul, Paul is saying that he comes under the spiritual authority of no man. He comes under the spiritual authority of no one but Jesus Christ. And so he asks, am I not free? Look at me as a man. Am I not free? What man do I have to answer to? No one. And what he's going to get at is that even an apostle, a man personally and physically handpicked by the Lord, even for that man, the Apostle Paul, he lays aside his rights when it comes down to the choice between love and liberty. Now, what we're going to see here is there are some people in the church in Corinth in that first century, uh, as, we, as we talked about in the early chapters, since Paul was, was not one of the original 12 apostles, some of the people in that church were doubting uh, Paul's authority as an apostle. Uh, so he's going to throw out now a, a few credentials here before he gets to the heart of his point. And one of the requirements in the early church of holding the office of apostle, one of the requirements today, that's why there are no, uh, uh, no one holds the office of apostle 
today in, in that sense, like because there were only 12 men in human history. And one of the, the requirements for holding that office is all 12 of them had personally experienced the resurrected Lord. And so Paul asks here in that regard, he says, uh, finishing out verse 1, Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And if you remember our study of the book of Acts, it's talking about his, uh, his own conversion when he was on his way to Damascus. I mean, his name was Saul. He was on his way to Damascus to round up Christians, to round up believers, and to bring them back to Jerusalem, to have them tried uh, and killed. And while he was on his way to Damascus, he, was, he, was in, he encountered uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and literally was knocked off of his uh, horse. And, and, you know, this is when Paul was converted. And, and, and so he asked here, Have I not seen the Lord Jesus Christ? And... In regards to his apostolic authority, he says, Are you not my work in the Lord? And so, the proof is in the pudding. Paul was the one who had planted that church in, in Corinth. And, and Corinth was a, a, a vile, nasty, sin-ridden, you know, sin city. It was like Las Vegas of that day, you know, that Paul had gone and planted that church there in Corinth. What what? You know, who would be foolish enough to try and plant a church in Las Vegas? But that's what Paul is referring to. That's an inside joke there, if you guys know that I came from Las Vegas. But anyway, from the church there. Anyway, a sin-ridden city that Paul went, he planted the church there, and it wasn't easy. It, it took an obvious work of the Holy Spirit, it is the point. The, it, it's, it's an obvious uh, evidence of Paul's calling, the fact that that church existed uh, at all, and the fact that, that he was an apostle. Verse 2, if I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So there might be other places in the world. Uh, you know, maybe there were places where Paul didn't stay as long. Uh, Maybe he hadn't gotten to some other cities or, or, or whatever in his, his, in his missionary journeys. Uh, Corinth was the second longest stay that Paul had to any, in any of the places where he planted churches, second only to Ephesus. He had spent three years in Ephesus. He spent a year and a half in, in Corinth planting that uh, uh, church there. And so Paul's saying, you know, there might be other places in the world where they could doubt my apostolic authority, but not in Corinth. God made Paul's calling and his apostolic authority, God made it very obvious to the, the Corinthians. That's what Paul is reminding them of. He's saying, you've seen uh, the work of God through me. And he says, verse 3, my defense to those who examine me is this. And he's going to come back to the context of love being superior to his own personal rights. And, and, he, and he's going to point out now, Again, the, the love over liberty based on his own personal rights. And he's, and he's going to point out his rights here. Verse 4, do we, that is apostles, have no right to eat and drink? In other words, are we not entitled just as you to the necessities of life? And Paul's not implying that the Corinthians were questioning his right to eat and drink and, and, and you know, have the necessities of life. What he's referring to is given the fact that he himself, uh, you know, has, he's, he has dedicated his life to full-time ministry, so to speak, working to establish the kingdom of God, ministering and, and teaching the church. He's saying, do I not have the right now to be fed by the church? Do I not have the right to be supported by the church? And the obvious answer is, is yes. And where does that idea come from? Where's Paul getting this idea? Well, we look over at Matthew chapter 10. And this is when Jesus was sending out the disciples, uh, the, the, the 12 disciples. And he's telling them to go minister to the lost. And he said, beginning there in verse 7, he said, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So go and minister. And then here it is, he says, go preach, and when you do, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, 
nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. So the Lord says, you, I, I want you to go. And when you go, you don't take anything with you. You don't take any money. You don't take any food. You don't take any uh, provisions. You don't even take a change of clothing. Why not? Because Jesus says here, it's all going to be provided for you by the ones that you're going to teach and, and minister to. As Jesus says, for a worker is worthy of his food. That's still up there. A worker is worthy of his food. An, an apostle deserves, in other words, to be supported. That's straight from the mouth of Jesus. And, and not just an apostle. Later, uh, in the book of Matthew, in that gospel, when later when Jesus sends out the 70, not just the 12, but he sends out the 70, and he tells them the same thing. He says, don't take anything with you. A minister, those who have devoted their lives to full-time ministry, a, a, a minister has the right to be supported um, by the people that he uh, ministers to. That's what Paul is talking about. And so with that, if I could have the ushers bring forth the offering plates. I said that first service and somebody yelled from the back, we don't have offering plates and we don't. <laughs> But Paul adds here, verse 5, do we have no right to take along a believing wife? In other words, Paul makes it clear that as a minister, he has the right to expect support, not only for himself, but for his family also. As do, he goes on, also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas. Cephas is just the Greek name for Peter. And so, uh, apparently... If not all, you know, most of all the other apostles were, were married and they took their wives along with them in their ministries, in their uh, travels, as they should, including Peter, which is interesting considering that the Catholic Church hails Peter as their first pope. And the reason it's interesting is because it contradicts their requirement of the pope uh, or any of their priests. The, the requirement is they have to be single and, and celibate, and, and certainly Peter was not. You remember when Jesus first came into uh, Capernaum to the house of Peter and the Bible tells us that it was Peter's mother-in-law who was sick and, and Jesus healed her uh, on the spot. So uh, Peter was definitely married. Verse 6, or is it only Barnabas and I, you've supported everybody else, or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? It's only the two of us that have to go out and get jobs, you know, it's at, at, at Raising Cane's or McDonald's or, or whatever. We got we to gotta support ourselves. Are we the only two? In other words, the church supported all of the other apostles. Peter, once he left his fishing business, he didn't have a, a job on the side outside of the church. Uh, all of the other ap apostles were being uh, financially uh, supported while the church in Corinth refused to support Paul uh, and Barnabas, which is which is very sad, given the fact that that Paul was the apostle who had planted that church. As I said, put, he put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into uh, that church. Spent eighteen months of his life there, and now not only is that church, not only are they the leadership denying Paul's apostolic authority, they're denying him even the the necessities uh, of life, and. Who would do that? No one. And Paul here in the following verses, he's going to give us some real life. He's like, you know, let's forget about ministry for a second. And let's just look at the world. Let's just look at, at, at society. And he's going to look at a few circumstances here to make his point. And he asks in verse 7, whoever goes to war at his own expense, aren't soldiers in an army, aren't they uh, supported and provided for by, by their government. Nobody joins the army and then the army says, all right, I'm going to need you to, to pay for this gun and this ammunition and the uniform and, and oh yeah, you're going to start, start making payments on the, uh, the battleship that we're building over in Annapolis. And it, they're supported by uh, their government. He says, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? If you're a farmer, isn't there a reward and uh, a payment at the end of the season, at the, at the harvest? Certainly there is. Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? If you're a rancher, isn't there a reward and a payment for all of, of your hard work? 
who in this world, who, who, who works a job and doesn't get paid for it? That's what Paul's uh, asking. And then making the point, doesn't he have the right to be supported by the people that he is ministering to, the people that he is feeding? And he says, verse 8, do I say these things as a mere man or does not the law say the same also? And so he's kind of covered it from this, you know, this, this idea of supporting ministers. He, he covered it from the idea of just the secular world perspective. And then everybody that has a job, everybody that works gets paid. And he's reminded us of the words of, of Jesus as well, supporting this idea. But here he says, what about the person who is more legally minded? What about the person who is, you know, kind of bound by the law? What, what does the law say? about supporting ministers as as Paul just is covering it from all different angles here he says verse 9 for it is written in the law of Moses you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain what in the world does that mean well we find this back in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and in those days the best way to separate the the hard outer husk part of, of the grain from the you know, the part that's edible, the part that's usable, uh, the, the inside. They didn't have heavy machinery back then, obviously. So the best way to separate the grain from the husk was to have ox uh, just continue to walk on it. They'd put it on the ground and have the oxen uh, walk on it. Uh, and as the ox is working, as he's walking in circles over and over in order to provide food for others, how cruel would it be to have him working in order to provide for others while he himself is being starved to death because you put a muzzle on his mouth. Well, he's working, he's going along, and the idea is he needs to be able to eat. He needs to be able to have nourishment himself as he is, is working uh, for others. The ox who grinds the corn should be able to eat the corn as well as he goes. But Paul says, finishing out verse 9, is it oxen God is concerned about or does he say it all together for our sakes and he answers his own question he says for our sakes no doubt this is written god didn't give this command in deuteronomy for for the sake of the ox it was an illustration that's for the the benefit of of the church and how the church is to operate and it says that he that is that our ministers he who plows should plow in hope and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of this hope. Hope being the expectation of recompense. The work, you know, providing the pay, providing for uh, your necessities of, of life. The person that plows away at, in ministry should expect good things to come his, his way. We were, we were kind of talking about this yesterday, how, how it's it's. It's kind of a of a, a misunderstanding or a false teaching where it, it it's believed in the church in the masses that you know a pastor is not a good pastor unless he's poor unless he's just barely scraping by and wearing old raggedy clothes or or, or whatever and that's just not biblical. Again, uh, the, the as we see here, the get, Paul's other writings is just like the. The laborer in regard to the minister, what is worth double his wages, whatever. If someone's worth this, the pastor's worth double. Now, what, what has spoiled the whole, you know, kitten caboodle is, is people taking advantage of that kind of thing. And people, you know, I, I need three jet airplanes or whatever as a pastor because I need to go here and there and, and, and whatever. Or I need a $10 million mansion with a, you know, doghouse that's got air conditioning in it and that, that kind of stuff. So... Um, it, it's kind of put a black eye on the church. We'll, we'll talk about that here in, in, in just a minute. But the point is, is the pastor's not meant to be poor. Uh, you know, certainly uh, God expects the, 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 the ministers to be well provided for, just as he expects you to be well provided for in your um, profession. Verse, verse 11, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Paul here illustrates that it is right for the spiritual work of God's ministers to be repaid with the financial support of the people they minister to. And, and you know, the idea is not like, well, my, my 
pastor, you know, is really, really uh, just a student of the Word and a great Bible teacher or whatever, and he just pours his heart out. Uh, so in return for him, I really, really, I, I pray for him a lot. You know, and that's a great thing, obviously. Um, but it, the idea, Warren Wearsby says that it is, it is a basic principle of the Christian life that when we receive spiritual blessings, we should in turn share our material blessings. And Paul says here, verse 12, if others are partakers, if other apostles are partakers of this right over you, and so it's not that the church wasn't supporting anyone, it's just that they refused to support the ones in Paul's mind who deserved it the most, and that's him and Barnabas. Because it was, again, uh, he he was the one that planted uh, that church there. And you think about it, how blessed was that church to have the Apostle Paul personally ministering to them, not just the 18 months that he spent there planting the church, but the letters and the encouragement, the, the leadership that he had set up in, in the church there. How, how blessed were, were, were they that, 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 that the Apostle Paul literally poured out his heart and his soul uh, into that church and that, at, that ministry and the people of that church. But then how shameless were they that for all that Paul did for them, they wouldn't even buy him a Happy Meal. I mean, they wouldn't even provide him with a ham sandwich. And, and that's, that's his point here. If, you are, if others are partakers of this right over you, he goes on, are we not even more? Nevertheless, he says, we have not used this Right. So we have not demanded, he and Barnabas, we have not demanded that we be financially supported. Those are the only two guys that had jobs. Paul was a tent maker. Uh, he had job, a, a job and support outside uh, of the church. Even though he had the right to be supported by the church, he says here, Barnabas and I, we have forfeited that right. And he goes on, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. And so there again, love over liberty, where Paul is making that point, and he's demonstrating that point through his own real life experience with this church. He says, I've got every right as an apostle and as a minister to be financially supported by your church, but he affirms with just as much passion his choice not to use that right based on the fact that it might hinder what is most important to him, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so once again, it's important to get paid and to have the necessities of life be provided for you, but that's not as important as the gospel. There's nothing more important in this universe than the work of the gospel. So Paul says, uh, pay me, don't pay me. That's between you and God. I'm going to be about God's business one way or uh, another. He says, verse 13, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? And he's referring to the Jewish priests, the the Levites, how God made a way for them to be able to partake in a portion of the sacrifices that were brought to them uh, to the altar. If you, uh, we're, we're studying the book of Exodus on the first Wednesday of each um, month, Wednesday night. And we're, we're actually just, we're talking about this and uh, in our study of Exodus, how God, how God did this. He made a way for the priests to be fed uh, and to be provided for because they, didn't, they weren't to have outside employment. They were to be devoted to the temple and, and, and serving and teaching and ministering. To, to the people. And in verse 14, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And so he takes it now from the Old Testament, Levitical uh, priesthood, now into the New Testament and the covenant of grace and those ministers, um, those who have devoted their lives to full-time ministry. Uh, he says the same applies. The, the, a teacher of the gospel should be provided for uh, by the gospel. And so we have, we have the words from the law. We have the words directly from Jesus. We look at uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 8, and this is where Jesus had sent out the, the 70. He said, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And, and, and so those 
who make the preaching of the gospel their life's work can expect the gospel f- to provide for them in, in return and to, ply, to supply all of their physical needs. So point being, the concept of a worker being worthy of his food, as Jesus said, it, it's a fundamental church principle that the church uh, dare not n- neglect. And so to, to the people who think that, that tithing uh, only relates to the law of Moses and, and, and the Old Testament. It's not relevant to us today, and, and you hear that a lot. But even those people can't deny the writings of the Apostle Paul here and, and throughout the New Testament that there is a command for the church to support its ministers. But how does the church support its ministers if the people don't believe in tithing? And, and so Paul illustrates here how it is those people... And that mindset of, you know what, I'm not called to tithe. Uh, at the very least, what Paul is saying is you are muzzling the ox. You are you're neglecting to feed the very one that is feeding you. And, and you, you're, you're starving the one who's feeding you if you're not helping to financially support the church. But Paul says, verse 15, I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. So the, the, Paul is saying here, look, I, I wrote all these things. I'm talking about all these things. And I want you to know this is not a hint. This is not a suggestion or a plea, Paul says, for me to get paid. Uh, quite the opposite. He says, for it would be better for me to die than that anyone should, be, that should make my boasting void. Now, remember the context of this section of the letter, lo- that love is more important than Paul's rights. And so, He's saying here, he only pointed out his right to be supported by the church so that he could then demonstrate the value in in giving up that support for the sake of the gospel. But in essence, what Paul is saying is this. Listen, I'd rather die now. I'd rather die now than to receive a a penny from you or a shekel or a a drachma was the, the Greek currency. He says, verse 16, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of for necessity is laid upon me. In other words, Paul says, I have no choice. I have to do it. Preaching the gospel is what I live for. It's the reason I was put on this earth. It doesn't have anything to do with money. This is the same Paul that said, I learned to be rich. I learned to be poor. I learned to be content whether I had, whether I didn't have, whether I'm clothed, whether I'm not clothed. I've learned to be content in all things. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters except the preaching of the gospel and, and you know, God's kingdom going forward. And so it's not about money. It's not about a paycheck. It, it is an absolute necessity uh, for Paul to be fulfilled in his life, the preaching of the gospel. He says, yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. If you are truly called to preach and to be a minister, to be a pastor, If you're truly called to preach by God, there is nothing going to stop you. And and you won't be happy doing anything else. Trust me, I tried. Now, being a pastor is hard. I've always been a hard worker. My wife will tell you I'm not afraid of, of, of manual labor, working hard. But what God has called me to do and to be at this church there might not be a whole lot of manual labor. There's some. But this is by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Just what it demands of you on a daily basis. Mentally, physically, spiritually. It's exhausting. Imagine yourself living in a fishbowl 24-7 where everybody is always peering in. And the accountability that comes with that. The responsibility that I take very, very seriously, the responsibility of, of rightly dividing the Word of God week in, week out. I don't just go, you know, there's, there's 20 hours of, of preparation, study, that goes into a, a 30, 40 minute message for me. Because I take that responsibility very, very seriously, God's Word. And it's daunting. It's a daunting task. Not everybody can take it. You have to be called. And any pastor who tells you that there's never been a time in their life where, they've, where they, they just get worn out, and they, they just want to quit and, 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 and somehow fade off into obscurity, they'd, they'd be lying. 
But you know what? Every time that I've gotten those kinds of, of thoughts where, man, this is so hard, I just want to quit. I just want to go away. What, what, what always follows that very quickly in my mind is this sort of infinite black hole that represents the question, what in the world else would I do where I would be complete and fulfilled and satisfied? And the answer is nothing. I remember when Pastor um, Jason was being um, first, you know, sort of considering whether the Lord was calling him to, to become a pastor or not. I spent... I spent the better part of four or five months literally trying to talk him out of it because I knew if I could talk him out of it that the Lord uh, wasn't in it. You remember when Jesus was being betrayed and, and, and rejected left and right and then he asked his disciples, sitting around a campfire, and he asked his disciples, are you guys going to leave me too? And they said to him, he's like, Lord, you have the words of life. Where else are we going to go? This is what I have to do. This is who I am, a, a preacher of the gospel. That's what Paul's relating to. Charles Spurgeon used to have a, a school of ministry, and he would tell his students, if there's anything else out there in the world that you could do for a living and be content and fulfilled, then go do it. The uh, Pastor Romaine, Pastor Chuck's assistant pastor for all those years, ex-Marine, you know, really, really leatherneck tough guy and I never I never got a, a, a chance to to meet him I know there's a few of you in here that that probably did but uh, I've heard a lot of the stories and and one was that anytime that someone would come into his office there in Costa Mesa and say to him you know uh, Pastor Romaine I think I'm being called into ministry I think I I think I want to become a pastor his response to them would always be get out of here I got enough men to clean up after, you know, around here. Just go away. You know, and, and you think about it, what that would do, it, was, it would separate the ones who were truly called and the ones who were just looking to try something new. And, and it would be only the, 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 the serious ones who knew they were called, who knew they couldn't go do anything else, that it, they would be the only ones that would come back to Romaine's office and say, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just have to do this. The Lord is calling me. I can't do anything else. My conscience won't let me do anything else. And that's Paul. Verse 17, for if I do this willingly, I have a reward but if against my will, even if I do this because I have no other choice, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Now what Paul's getting at is that even though the church in Corinth should have supported him, it was a wealthy church, very affluent people in that church, and Paul had labored and sown much into them. But the bright side in all of this as, as Paul relates here, the one thing that he had going for him in Corinth that none of the other apostles had is that there was not one person in Corinth who can accuse Paul of being in the ministry for the money. They might question his calling. They might question his, uh, you know, his, his motives or, or, or his um, faithfulness. But... They could never question his apostolic authority and the motives behind it. And so again, it comes back to, um, wow, it's a shame that as a pastor, yeah, I'm a full-time pastor, and yes, I get, I get paid. And I, my, my family is provided for by, by the church. And, the, and again, it's the way it should be. But how... how, how uh, it's still like a little black cloud there. There's still this little thing of, of how many people are in our congregation that think, well, maybe he makes too much money. Or man, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I should consider going into you know, ministry or whatever. That looks like an easy job. He only works on Sunday mornings, for goodness sake. <laughs> you know. uh, but see, there's just that black eye. There's that cloud there over the people who truly are just doing it because the Lord called them to do it. Uh, one thing I have going for me is I can promise you this. I can show you my tax returns. I made five times as much money doing what I did before I came into to, to full-time ministry. 
And he asks here, verse 18, what is my uh, reward then for not being paid? And he answers his own question, that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge. I don't have anything hindering my testimony or impeding my resolve to present the gospel to people who are lost. He says that I may not abuse my authority in, in the gospel. Many people, many evangelists, whatever you want to call them today, in Paul's day and today, that, uh, that are only in it for the money. Um, it's a shame. There's probably someone sitting in this congregation today that the, mention that I men- the, the, the moment that I mentioned tithing, or the fact that we need to be supporting ministers, they're probably like in their mind, ah, oh, here we go. Yep, here it is. He just wants my money. All churches are alike. But Paul says here, uh, you know what? No one can say that about me. That was his own personal conviction. He says, I'm, I'm not taking a dime. For though I am free, he says, from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. Wow that I might win the more. So very simply, he set aside his right to be financially supported. He set aside all of his rights for the sake of the lost. And it's sort of a paradox, right? Because he's free, which means he can do what he wants. But what he wanted, what he chose, was to set aside his rights and to set aside his freedom for your sake and for my sake, for the sake of others. It's like if all of us were stranded on a deserted island and somehow there was a vote and it, were de- it was decided that, that I was given charge over everyone. I'm the governor or whatever. I've been given preeminence over everyone in the group. But then I turn around and say, okay, you know what? What I choose to do with my authority and what I choose to do with the preeminence that you have given me is I choose to make myself subservient to all of you. With my authority... I order myself to be your slave. Now, how that goes against my flesh, because I promise you my flesh wants to be on top, my flesh wants to be in charge, my flesh wants to be served, and and it's just, it's in total direct contrast to the world, because the ideology of the world says, you know, the more more people you have under you, The more people you have serving you, the better you are, the more successful you are. But it's just the opposite in God's kingdom where you take and you flip-flop that ideology and you say, okay, I have the freedom, I have liberty to ask, you know, to be served. I have liberty, but I'm going to take that liberty and I'm going to flip-flop it. I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to use my liberty to serve you. That's the bedrock of Christianity. That is, that is the very, very heart of Christ on the cross. As I said last week, he had every right. He was well within his rights to come down off of that cross and say, I don't have to be up here. I didn't do anything wrong. But what hung him on that cross and what kept him nailed to that cross weren't the nails. It was his love for you and his love for me. It's the bedrock of Christianity. He's choosing to serve others. Verse 20, Paul expounds, he says, To the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. Paul used the law to point Jews to Christ. That's how the Jews related to you know, Scripture. How they related spiritually was from the law. So Paul says, I use the law to point them to Christ. That's what the law was for. All the law and the prophets, they point to Jesus That was the point of the Old Testament. But he says here, verse 21, to those who are without law, speaking of everyone else, there's either Jews or Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So speaking of the Gentiles, he says, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. So the Gentiles, they didn't know anything about the law of Moses. And so... What does the law mean to them? So for Paul to come along and say, well, let me tell you what the law says. and I'm gonna, he, didn't, he didn't bound them by the law. He followed in the footsteps of Jesus where, uh, okay, if you relate to the law, I'm going to teach you from the law. If you relate to grace, if you relate to this, that, whatever you relate to, that's how I'm going to relay truth to you in a way that's the most easy for you to understand. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul did. What did Jesus say to the woman, the Samaritan woman that he met at the well? She's there to draw water. What did he do? He related to her like, you know, I 
am the living water. You drink of this, you'll never thirst again. He met her right where she was at. You can go through Scripture one after another where Jesus did that. The, the, the rich young ruler, same thing. Go sell everything that you own. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. You have riches in heaven, untold. You know, so it, Paul just like, whatever circumstance, I became a Jew to the Jew. I became a Greek to the Greek. Whatever and however uh, got the message and the truth across to them. Now, that doesn't mean the message ever changed. The message never changed and truth never changed with Jesus or Paul or any teacher of the gospel. It's just that he's saying, relate to the people. Meet them right where they're at and tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the gospel. Share with them the truth in a way that they can, that they can best relate to. And verse 22 says, To the weak I became as weak. And he's speaking again of those who had not obtained the knowledge of, of liberty that we have in Christ. Paul, in the last chapter of the weak ones, he, it's the legalists. It's those who are bound up in, in religion. You know, man's approach to God rather than God, you know, relationship where God reaches down to man. Religion is how man tries to reach up to God. Well, man can never reach up to God because we're, we're unholy. God is holy. He can't be in the presence of sinful man. And so... The religious, the legalists, the ones bound up by the law, they are the weak ones, Paul said. But I related to them in a weak way. And then I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be a partaker of it with you. Here's a man who was other-centered. All of his rights he surrendered in order to be able to minister to every person who ever lived. And he's even ministering to us today, isn't he? Through the, through the work of the Holy Spirit and his writings. So here's the Apostle Paul, giving the example of how we all need to be others-centered. We need to forsake selfishness, selfism. That's a worldly uh, ideology. I become all things to all men that I might be all that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Now, the gospel, the word of God is offensive to some people. And the gospel is offensive to some people. It offends people for you to tell them you're a sinner. And you're a sinner just like the rest of us. And all of us are bound uh, for hell without Jesus Christ, without the blood that was shed for you on, on the cross. You look at people and say, you're a sinner. You're going to hell without Jesus. That's offensive to some people. And that's okay. But what Paul is saying here is just like, I'm going to do everything I can to not be an offense or a stumbling block to people before the gospel has even had a chance to be presented to them. Don't be a stumbling block. Paul says, I'm going to do all that I can not to hinder the gospel because he recognizes the big picture. He saw things from an eternal perspective perspective that's the way God wants us to always view things if we are when we are able to zoom out and see that bird's eye view and to see life from a, a, a kingdom minded eternal perspective I promise you your troubles become less and less and and all of the, the aches and the pains and the turmoils and all the tribulations that we have to walk through in this life they're going to make a whole lot more sense when we are uh, e eternally minded. And so Paul says, I want you to be able to zoom out and, and recognize, you know, what's most important. I want you to major on the major and not on the minor. It's important that we as Christians and that we, and Paul's going to relate here to running a race, you know, running the race of, of life. We run a race, a race we want to win. I'm a very competitive person, no matter what I do. If I'm playing ping pong with one of the youth over here, I want to win. If we're playing Uno, you know, I want to win. And the, and the, and the, the, the point is, is, is that we as Christians, we ought to want to run this race, not for the sake of running, but for the sake of winning. And, and, and understand that as we're going through life, we're not running toward salvation. We're not running toward trying to be saved. If you're saved, if you've accepted Jesus in your heart, that race has already been won on the cross. What we're running toward is more faithfulness unto the Lord. What we're running toward is more obedience. What we're running for is sanctification, being more and more molded into the image of God each and every day. That's the race of life. That's how you win. 
He says, verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? So this race of life, everybody's in it. If you're breathing, you're in the race. You're running. But he says, one receives the prize. So run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. In other words, we don't run just for the sake of running. Everyone alive is running. We're in the race. But we want to run for the sake of, of winning. And, and the pursuit of winning, being the one who gets the prize, means that I'm going to have to go above and beyond everyone else. I'm going to have to go above and beyond in my training and in my preparation. That's why he says here, the, the one who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Meaning, if you're an athlete, and Paul, he, in his writings, he's always equating to his writings to, to athletic Events now. Corinth was a very, very. There was a, a an arena there where they had, you know, a, a athletic events, sort of Olympic type events, uh, all the time. These people they related to, you know, sports to to athletics. And if you're if you're an athlete training for an event, what he's saying here is being temperate means you're going to have to say no to the things that are going to get in the way of you reaching your goal. In other words, you know. If I'm training for an athletic event, if I'm going to be an Olympian or whatever, I'm going to have to recognize, okay, I can't stay out late. I've got to get my rest. I can't eat that that peach cobbler, you know, or that strawberry shortcake because I have to watch um, my diet. And the race of life is no different. I want to get to the finish line, but even more than that, I want to win. And the way that I win, spiritually speaking, is... Uh, I, I, I want to get to that finish line dragging as many people with me as I can through my words, through my life, through my actions. I want to be that positive influence for God's kingdom and for the growth of, of God's kingdom. That's how I win the race of life. It's not just about me getting to heaven. You know, I can do that. That's pretty easy. I just have to have faith. In it. I want to take you with me. I want to take everybody that I know. I want to take as many people with me. As, as possible. I want to help as many people as possible to become obedient to the Word and faithful to what God has called them to do and to be. That's the main reason why I'm standing up here every Sunday. And so, back to love over liberty. What Paul is speaking to the Corinthians is that if you're going to succeed at being an effective champion of the gospel, then you're going to have to, know, you're going to, have to say no to the things that might, uh, you know, get in the way of you reaching that goal. You're going to have to say no uh, to eating meat sacrificed to idols. And this might rub some people the wrong way. You might, you're going to have to say no to that second beer or or some people that first beer. You know, you know who you are. Your, your, Your conscience tells you these things. If you're going to run an effective race and if you're going to win uh, the crown and Comparing this again to a literal physical race, let's say the 100 yard dash, think of the Olympics, Usain Bolt, or, you know, probably the most famous sporting event in the world. It says here, now they, obt- they, they do it to obtain a perishable crown. Those who are running in the Olympics, they're, they're wanting to obtain that gold medal. And Paul's saying, that gold medal, yeah, it's great. But it's a perishable crown. In other words, it's a, it's a crown, it's a prize that's going to burn one day with the rest of the world. It has no eternal value to it. Somebody tell me right now who won the gold medal in the 100-yard dash in 1862. You don't know. I don't either. I don't even know if there were Olympics in 1862. But my point is, no one remembers. No one cares. It's, it's a perishable crown. And so he says here, but we, we meaning Christians, we, what we do for the kingdom, our race, we run for an imperishable crown, a crown that will never pass away, an eternal reward. Therefore, he says, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Ever go to the gym? And, and there's always some guy over in the corner and wanting everybody to look at him. And he's over there at the mirror, you know, and he's doing this, you know. Ha, 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 oh, like, boy, he's really mad at that mirror over there. Or go to like a, you know, a karate dojo. What you see is a bunch of people just very aggressively punching the air. 
And, what, and that's what Paul's relating to, to, you know, pursuing a crown that's perishable, pursuing a crown that's only going to burn one day. It, it's like punching the air. It's not going to accomplish anything for you. But, verse 27, I discipline my body and bring it under subjection. If there's a verse in this Bible uh, or in this chapter today that's underlinable, it's this one. But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. What does that mean? It means I give no provision for my flesh. I keep it suppressed and I keep it under control. I give it no life whatsoever. I starve it to death every single day. Before you, came, before you came to know Jesus, it was your flesh that had dominion over your body. But when the natural man comes to Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that flesh then gets turned upside down and gets put in its proper place and it becomes subservient to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit in, in your life. So that, that's me bringing my body into subjection. He says, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And it, and, and it goes without saying, you know, a fleshly preacher is not going to be very effective in the pulpit. And then a fleshly Christian, you, what, whoever God sends you to speak to in the world, whoever God puts you in front of, and whoever your uh, inner and outer circle is, um, you're not going to accomplish much as it relates to advancing God's kingdom if, um, you know, you, you are a fleshly Christian, one who is driven by the flesh and has not become subservient to the Spirit uh, in, in your life. And as, as, as Paul says here, as ministers, I remember when I first became a pastor, and I was meeting with Pastor Richard of Calvary Chapel Charleston over there, good friends, and he was, you know, somewhat of a, of a, of a mentor, at least from how to plant a church. He'd gone through that. Uh, how to establish the government and the church and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I remember every time I would meet with him, uh, he would always, for anybody who's over maybe 50, probably can remember the show Columbo and how uh, he would always interview people and then he was getting ready to leave and then he'd turn around and say, oh, one more thing. And then he would drop the bomb, you know. But that was, that was how Richard would do. Every time we would have a meeting, we'd get ready to, we'd pray and get ready to, i get ready to walk out or whatever. Hey, oh yeah, remember, don't do anything to disqualify yourself for what God's calling you to do. Don't disqualify yourself. And I've never forgotten it. And I, I share that with, with, with Paul, with, with Jason, with, with Sean. I'm always saying, don't disqualify yourself from ministry. But you too, don't disqualify yourself. Walk above reproach. Walk in a way that brings glory and honor to God and, and, and therefore gives you a great voice for, for uh, uh, the blood that He shed for everyone in this world and, and how he wants you to share that gospel. Don't disqualify yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we understand that each of us here today, we, we don't have the ability to be qualified without your uh, indwelling, without the blood that courses through our veins that you shed on Calvary, without the, 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 the help of the Holy Spirit, the paracletos, the ones that comes alongside, Father, that we, we, just, we just ask, Lord, that you would be with us and help us, God, to be all that you would have us to be, to say all that you would have us to say. I pray that you would make us uh, keenly aware of those around us, Lord, and, and the, the actions, our words and our actions, Lord, that uh, even though it might not be sin in our own conscience, Lord, that we would never be driven to do something that would cause our brother or sister to be drawn into sin or be drawn into uh, anywhere that makes them stumble. Uh, God, I pray that you would make us uh, like Paul, and more importantly, like Jesus, as Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Lord, help us to imitate your love and your grace uh, for your creation, for your people, uh, and help us, Lord, to, to love uh, with your heart in that we would not be other-centered. I'm sorry, we would not be self-centered, Lord, that we would especially be other-centered as you were other-centered, Lord, demonstrated uh, most pointedly, Lord, on the cross. So we thank you for your blood. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for your word. May it penetrate our hearts today, God, uh, and may it uh, just be written upon our souls, our minds, our hearts, um, God, that we would become more and more uh, molded into your image and, and, and one step closer toward 
uh, sanctification and having that life that's pleasing to you where you would look down and say that's my boy that's my girl that's a chip off the old block right there uh, help us God to walk in a way that brings you glory in Jesus name amen if you need prayer I'd love to pray with you after service speaking of prayer don't forget that tonight is our prayer service now Jason said something earlier he said that prayer is more important than the word or more important than worship I I would disagree with that uh, but Prayer certainly is equally as important. Uh, and so we, the most important service we do on, a, on a, a monthly basis is to meet here on the fourth Sunday night of each uh, month. And we, we meet here and we pray together as a body. We worship, spend some time in personal testimony or ever how the Spirit leads. Uh, and that is tonight here at 6 o'clock. So we invite you to come out for that. This uh, Wednesday there will be no midweek service because we have VBS uh, so be praying for them. Uh, and then uh, next Sunday, we will pick up our study in 1 Corinthians back in uh, uh, chapter 10. So go ahead and read forward on that. Let's all stand and we'll close. Sorry for going a little over today, but there's grace. There's sin abounds, grace abounds the more. Amen. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear have a blessed week god bless you thank you for listening to change the world with pastor vic carroll from calvary somerville it is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord jesus christ